There was ever a day we just need to be with an attitude of recognizing just the holiness and the majesty and the might of God. It is certainly the day we're living in. Amen? Because on every hand, it seems that the world is uh, falling apart. Things are coming unhinged at the hinges. So it's important that we just continue to hold on to the anchor. Last week, I started a series of messages called uh, The Day of Trouble and what to do in the day of trouble. And we use this as a text for our passage out of Psalm 20. So if you want to open your Bible, we'll be looking at it there several times throughout the message to see just what our response is in the kind of tribulation days that we're living in. Now, don't take that as the tribulation. These are days prior. You think this is bad. You don't want to be around during tribulation. Amen? Really? Things are really going to be crazy then. But the Bible does say in the last days that perilous times would come and gives a great description of difficulties. Last Sunday when I started preaching this message, I went into the first 15 minutes of it sharing a testimony uh, of a journey that Kathy and I had been on since early April, really since the beginning of the year, of just uh, some things that we've experienced, and many of you are familiar with that. We won't rehash all that again, but just to say that troubles come. And I'm not talking about just the troubles that come to us in the context of perhaps our rebellion. If you're a Christian, you really honestly know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you choose at some point to quit being submissive to Him, surrendering your heart to Him, then, well, you ain't seen trouble <laughs> until, until those kind of days come. The Lord chastens us. He's a good father, and it's for our benefit. And, you know, there's a chastening in a negative sense, which is that kind of chastening. And there's a chastening in a positive sense, which is what, what we're dealing with in our text today, which, which we dealt with last week, continuing and ending today in this regard. But to say this, that, yes, troubles come if we're not right with God. God will use things to get us to, to the place of uh, paying attention to being repentant, to humble us, to bring us back to the place of our first love relationship. Because he loves us that much and he cares about us that much. But there's another kind of trouble. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. There's going to be a lot of problems. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Uh, now, that wasn't a rah, 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 hooray, hooray, you know, defense, defense. That wasn't like cheerleading when he said, be of good cheer. That cheer is in the context of, hey, you have everything you need because you belong to me, Jesus, that you need to deal with the trouble that's going to face you. Yes, you're going to have trouble. We've talked about the, the onslaught against our lives as Christians. Obviously, we have that, that external foe, you know, uh, of the world, the whole system. This culture is anti-Christ that we live in. I'm not talking about just America. I'm talking about the general global mindset is anti-God and anti-Christian. Men want to live for themselves. Men choose to uh, create a cultural environment about themselves. It really just caters to themselves, all right? That's contrary to the will of God for our life, and that will oppose you. As a Christian, when you seek to go forward, there's going to be a lot of opposition for the way you choose to live your life, the way you choose to, to the way you speak, the way you act, the way you respond. The world's not going to like it. it and Jesus said, if they hated me, uh, you're my disciple. They're going to hate you. So kind of get over it. It's going to happen. The second thing is that troubles come not only from the world, but from, uh, from the, we know Satan hates us. All those warnings throughout the New Testament letters that have, were given to us and to the church were, were warnings about Satan seeking an advantage in our life, to build up strongholds in our life, to bring us into captivity in some place in our spiritual walk in life. But hey, Jesus has also overcome the wicked one. He's defeated the devil. Satan is a defeated enemy. And the Bible says it's for you and I that are believers in Christ, we're willingly serving Jesus. The wicked one cannot touch us. Praise the Lord. So we can have victory in that regard. But there are, there's conflict in, in the spiritual arena of our, of our enemy. But there's even conflict from within. Our own flesh will oppose God at times and will seek to raise itself up and say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do because that's what I want to do. All right? So we have these external foes of trouble. But again, we're living in a, in a world that's plagued by sin. We're living in a fallen world. It's, it's been corrupted because of sin, because Adam and Eve rebelled against God and centered into the, all, of, all of, of, of this surrounding environment, culture, and world that we live in. So troubles come. Things don't go our way, you know. There's some, uh, some, some repulsive bumper stickers, but basically it's down to life happens, you know, that things happen in life that are bad. You know, troubles come. But as Christians, uh, it doesn't exempt us, but we can, we have a whole different mindset and a whole different value system and a whole different way of living that should put us in a completely unique and different kind of environment and arena. I shared a lot of the things that Kathy and I had gone through in recent months, but I know uh, as your pastor and someone who prays for you often that many of you have gone through some very difficult days, you know, in, in last months and weeks and even years. There's been some hard times. There's been times of family conflict. There's been times of financial conflict. There's been times without work, perhaps, maybe even now. There's been a lot of stuff that you deal with in the world that you live in. And 
you know, that, that the troubles are, are plaguing you on every side. It just, again, happens because of the, the very world that we live in. The day of trouble. The day of trouble comes, but we as Christians, we don't have to be defeated. And we don't have to be overcome by those things. And that's the heart of this message. And that's the heart of Psalms chapter 20. When the Lord, uh, when, when this, this prayer is being prayed unto the Lord, it has to do in, in a day of battle. But understand, we don't have to be in Afghanistan to be in battle. We can be right here in battle in our everyday spiritual lives. Amen. But he said, what do you do when these troubles come and difficulty comes? Well, here was the prayer. It said, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God, the God of Jacob, set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and your burn offerings be acceptable. So he goes on, and we'll talk about some more of this, this prayer in just a moment. But just to summarize what he's saying here is, you know, God can do some things when trouble comes in your life. God is available to you as a child of God to minister to you in this time. In fact, there's a couple of words you may even want to underline that we talked about last week. May the Lord answer you. Praise God that we as Christians have an avenue in the day of trouble. We're not up to our own, you know, connivings. We're not up to our own little way of trying to finagle our way out of something and scheme our way out of something. And hey, we have a God who's on the throne, who's omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, who knows all things, can do all things, is more powerful than all things, all right? And he's available to us, so may he answer you. And then he, the prayer was, you know, may he, the God of Jacob set you securely. In other words, these things don't destroy us, like the winds and the rains and the flood and, and the, the parable that Jesus shared about having your life securely set on a foundation. And that foundation is the Word of God and obedience to the Word of God. He says, man, if you, if you, you know, have this foundation where you're on the rock, he said that when the winds and the rains and the floods come, and they come to everybody, all right? They come to all kinds of people in all kinds of places of the world. Even in those times, may they not wash you away. May they not flood you. May they not destroy your life. May you, be, may you have some established security on high. And then he said, may he send you help. From the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary in the Old Testament, we know, was the place where the children of God would meet with God, whether it was in the, 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 the tent of tabernacle, the meeting place in the wilderness, or whether it was in the temple. It was finally built by Solomon, where God's presence and holy presence resided. Hey, may the Lord meet you in the sanctuary. May his help come from the sanctuary. His support comes from the sanctuary. And that's, uh, I think, some obvious ones, that we are the temple of the living God. So we have an ever-present help, the Bible says, in time of need. Right here, right now, you got what you need. You say, well, I don't see it, I don't feel it. You got it anyway. You have what you need. That's what grace is all about in the life of the Christian. And God is available. And may he remember all your meal offerings and, and, your, and your burnt offerings. May there be remembrance of those, those acts of worship that you do. And it's not that, well, you've won favor with God. You already have favor with God. God's accepted you in Christ Jesus. He's given you what you need. But may you have a... a, a uh, a response from God that's a, it's a holy and a righteous response because you've been one who belongs to him. You've demonstrated it by your lifestyle. When he talks about these offerings and the burnt offerings and meal offerings, it all represents our salvation and, and the price that was paid for our salvation. Uh, the applicable part, the part to, of application for our life would be in Romans where he says, you know, you present your body as a living sacrifice Holy acceptable to the Lord, for this is your reasonable service of worship. I think it's the way the New American Standard puts it. Your re this, you know, it's what God expects for you to dedicate yourself totally and wholly to Him. Uh, I was listening on the radio as I went to the first worship service this morning, around 7.30 on the way over there. And there was a guy on, doing a little uh, ad on one of the station, Christian stations I was listening to about radical discipleship. And I thought, well, is there any other kind? I mean, is there any other kind? It's like in the 70s, people talk about with well, a deeper Christian life. And then it went to the spirit-filled Christian life. And then, folks, that's, that's the only kind of Christian life there is. I mean, there's, there's not plan A, plan B, pick which one you want. Uh, and some people say, well, Brother Joe, you know, and, and, and Paul talked about the carnal Christians. No, he wasn't, he wasn't um, making that statement about carnality in the lives of Christians is, a, is, a, is like an option. That something, well, I, I, I'll choose not to be an on fire Christian. I'm going to be a carnal Christian. I'm a, I'm a carnal Christian. Well, that's shame on you. That's not an option there. It's a rebuke. All right? It's not like you can be this. It's cool. No, he's saying that you're a babe. You're an infant. So 
for people today, and this is really popular in, in the church age that we're living in, where people kind of have this God thing, spiritually thing going on over here. They're just living, you know, like however they want to live. But they're a spiritual person, you know. Uh, it's, just, it's amazing. You just turn on TV sometime, and you see people who just step out on the stage or step out into the, uh, uh, into the arena of entertainment, and they're obviously, you know, not anywhere near the kingdom, by the way, they, they're talking, their language, their, their looks, their, the way they're dressing, you know, they're falling out on every other corner. And, you, and they say, oh, but I love Jesus. The Bible says, Paul said, I fear for you lest you should receive another Jesus who is not the true Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. And there is another gospel out there today. All right. So we're, we're not talking about that kind of mind. We're talking about people who really do have a walk with God. And it's not pretend for them. It's not something they do on Sundays, you know. It's that separation of church and state. Some of you have separation of church and Monday, you know. And, and there's two different worlds you're living in. It's not that. No, you realize that your Christianity is every day. And, and, and as you do that, you're serving up. But at the same time, you realize that, man, the rain is falling and it rains on the just as well as the unjust. And there's trouble that comes. And so I know that much as we've experienced some things in our own house and, and household and family of going through ups and downs and, and, and fiery furnaces at sometimes it seems, so do you. And I think sometimes we fear that we're the only one or think we're the only one going through something in our life. And you certainly miss the mark if you're kind of so in, turned inwardly that you think you're the only one who has to deal with all these horrible, terrible things that are happening to you. They happen to everybody. And this is what the, the prayer of Psalm is all about. Hey, that trouble does come, but when trouble comes, we have a God that is bigger than all the troubles and all the trials. And even though you may be somehow thinking in your own mind as a Christian, well, I just feel like I'm praying and God's not hearing, or maybe, you know, the throne is empty. I mean, everywhere I turn, it's problems. And then I look at the world and it's crime, it's corruption, it's decaying society, and lives prosper and truths fade. And, you know, hey. That's the world we live in. But we don't live, you know, Paul put it this way. I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day in the Spirit. What's he saying? There was a certain day on the Lord's Day, and I was in one place but another at the same time. I was on Patmos but in the Spirit. And I think that's where it is for us as believers. We realize that we're in this world, we're not of it. We have our dealings in this world, but our, our roots are set somewhere else. Our life sources from some other place. Our grace pours out of the throne room of God. And so God will meet us in these difficult times. So David the psalmist, and I quoted this last week, where he said, you know, he hath made my feet like hind's feet. And a hind was that tiny little deer that lived on the mountainous rocks, and his feet are made for climbing. And what God says, you know, God, is, God has prepared you for whatever you're going to face and whatever you experience. If you turn to him and you look to him in the day of trouble, you'll find the answer. You'll find that God will set you secure. You'll find that he will send help. He will support you. He will remember, you know, that you belong to him, that you're his child, and he has a covenant relationship that he's made to you. Last week we talked about three reasons out of six of why does trouble come? Why, why are these things happening? You know, what is God up to? And the first is the most obvious to me is that what God wants in every one of our lives is to convey His glory, all right? That the glory be honoring, our life would be honoring God and glorifying Him in every way. That's, that's the reason you live, by the way. That's the reason you were born, all right, was to bring glory and honor to God. That's the your perfect and foremost whole duty is just to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, all your body. That brings glory and honor to God. Now, once you meet Christ, oh, that's obviously the axis, you know, that everything turns on. That I want my life to bring glory to God. What are you doing? The Bible says in everything you do to, to honor God, to bring glory to God. So if there's anything that's happening in my life that's not going to glorify God, I, I need to either stop it, all right, or turn from it, or somehow make sure that my life is bringing glory and honor to God. So we talked about the second thing we dealt with was to certify the reality and the life and the power of God in our life and through our lives. So first of all, our life is to bring honor to God, to glorify Him. We compliment God, basically. And then I used the illustration last week of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in the fiery furnace. And they were walking around loose, and there was a fourth one like the Son of God that was walking with them. And there they were in the fiery furnace, in the midst of the deepest kind of trouble that you could possibly experience in your physical life. They've been thrown in the middle of it. God didn't deliver them away from it. He delivered them in it. And this is where God gets glory in our life, so to say. And this is where a testimony is established in our life. If you go through problems and crisis 
in your life and you just go through it like everybody else does. It's wine, it's complain, it's woe is me, it's poor me. And I just, you know, you're mad at the world, you're mad at God. Hey, there's no power nor reality of God being manifest in your life. None whatsoever. The heart of everything you're experiencing is, one, that he'd be glorified and that people see the reality of God in your life. When Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were called out of the fiery furnace, the king made a, a compliment to them about the greatness of God and their God and how their God delivered them and then made a, made a point to make that testimony known to everybody in the kingdom. In fact, if you didn't acknowledge and give glory to their God, your house would be turned into a dung heap, basically an outhouse of some sort, all right? So you had this opportunity to bring glory to God. But so often in the midst of the fiery furnace of difficulties and trials of life, that's not what happens. The Apostle Paul said, you know, you are living epistles. In other words, that we're, our lives are to bring glory to God so that whatever we're experiencing in our life, it certifies to other people around us the power of God. And even on our own heart, it brings out witness of the presence and the grace and the glory of God. This is all about the grace of God ministering and manifesting itself in your life. The third thing we talked about was to compel us into the will of God for our lives. This is two of the illustrations we used. One was Isaiah and Uzziah. Remember Uzziah and Isaiah? Uzziah was the king. Isaiah was the prophet. In chapter 6, Uzziah dies. And we talked about how many theologians believe that they were very close, if not related. Most likely that Isaiah had gotten his eyes off the kingdom of God and put him on the kingdom of Uzziah. Welcomed to the palace, accepted on every level. All right, Very close relationship with the king. And perhaps by some means or measure, there had been this process where he was losing his first love. But it says in Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And sometimes we have to get in crisis modes in our life before we see the Lord. Our eyes are on other things, on other situations. The psalmist wrote, says, you know, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my feet had nigh well slipped. What's he saying? He said, I was about to backslide because the world seemed to be doing anything they wanted to do live for any pleasure and satisfy any desire they had, and they got away with it. And what happens, he said, I began to focus on those things, and I got absorbed by those things. Why is there no pain? Why is there no problems? Why aren't they vexed like Christians are and God's people are? He said, I got to the point I just about to backslide, he said, until I came into the sanctuary for the Lord, and I realized, and the rest of that psalm, it's 73 or 78, I think it's 73, where he goes through and he talks about that uh, after that, he said, when I got in God's presence, I began to see their end, I saw that judgment was coming, hell was certain, and the problems that I faced were pretty minor compared to what they were getting ready to experience in their life because they rejected God. What God does in our lives as Christians, because he is committed to us, and because he does love us, he is going to work in such a way as that we do become that living epistle, and the things that we do experience in our life are there for the glory of God to catapult us into the will of God and to move us towards the, the will of God for our life and to get us to the place to really hear from God. In Isaiah, it transformed his life when crisis came. You know the story of Joseph. We shared that. Finally sold, into, thrown into a pit, sold to slavery, gone into slavery. From there he went into prison. Out of prison he comes and he becomes the second leader in all of Egypt till his brothers stand before him. And finally they realize who he is and they become broken, repentant, and apologetic. But he says, listen, those things you intended for evil, God intended for good. What did he say? God allowed that to happen. If, basically, if God didn't engineer it, he allowed it. And I believe many times God is engineering things in our life that we don't like and they don't take. The Bible says no chastening is pleasurable in the moment. It's not fun to go through some of these things. I mean, how many of you have a real good time when you're having problems? No. It's not something we throw a party over. Although James said, you know, my brother count it all joy. That sounds like a party to me. When you come against divers, tribulations and trials and temptations, there ought to be this because God is working in your life. So we have this commitment from God of his grace, his protection, and his strength and his mercy to give us what we need whenever we need it. It transformed these men's lives. Those are the three things we talked about last week. Let's get to these other three very quickly. I have a couple of wrap-up points that I do want to make about how we handle the steps we should take in our life. Fourth thing is to confirm God's ministry through our lives. How often has God used the situations of our life to develop our ministry in us to move in developing our ministry and to hone our life for the ministry that he's called us to. Because every one of us that are believers have a ministry. We all have some place of service. We all have some place where we're supposed to be serving God, where God wants to use us. 
And what God will do is sometimes things will happen in our life to bring about his purpose in our life and his will in our life and literally almost to, to push us to the place to get into what his call is for our life. We go through problems. It was the apostle Paul who said, listen, we, God comforts us in the midst of our crisis, though. He said, once he's comforted us, we can comfort others with the comfort that we've been comforted with. Now, this is beautiful. And this is such a, a glorious thing about how God works. In, in life without God, failure comes, nothing but condemnation, more defeat, more failure comes. But when you come to Christ, even when failure comes or even sin comes, grace comes when our hearts are broken. Amen. Grace comes. And with grace, though, it's like now that even this particular area that I may have failed God in because I've walked in now to his grace, his forgiveness and chosen to be what he's called me to be. Now I fail, but now I'm walking in Christ. Now God begins to use me to minister to other people who are experiencing even the same failure. That applies not only to the negative in regard to sin, but even to failures in our life in regard to just falling on our face at times, all right? Not in rebellion to God, but crisis and difficulties, and I stumble. James said we all stumble in many ways, but I'm stumbling forward. And God begins to use those things in my life, the lessons he teaches me, to learn in turn to share those lessons with other people who are experiencing the same thing that I experience. In other words, in the kingdom of God, all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, you may be sitting there today in some kind of self-condemning mode. Oh, I just blew it. I failed. I did this. And hey, you ought, you're a sorry, rotten individual, by the way, okay? That's going to happen. We all are. You blew it, all right? But you can sit there and whine. All right, and you can sit there and soak up all the condemnation Satan wants to heap on you, or you can finally realize that Jesus died for all sin, for all men, for all time. And you can come to the throne of mercy and fall down before your heavenly Father and confess your sin to him. And he will forgive you and he will cleanse you. But he will also begin to do something on a deeper level in your life as a result of that. God begins to confirm and use even failures and sin, even, but not even that, even troubles that come in life. He'll confirm his ministry through your life. When Paul went to Corinth, when you begin to study that first epistle, you see where he was in the middle of all kinds of problems. There was opposition. I mean, you know, if Paul were a modern day apostle today and he got off the plane and, you know, in Corinth, there would be people out there with banners, you know, down with Paul. Paul's not tolerant. He doesn't love homosexuals. You know, all these signs would be out there. Paul hates women. All, you know, all that stuff would be going on. You know, wouldn't that be the culture today? We'd have every alphabet out there from, you know, all those alphabets that are out there and all these organizations. And against, against Paul and his ministry. But, you know, Paul, and I would imagine just because Paul is a man, and sometimes you forget that, he put his pants, well, I don't know if it were pants, but, you know, he got dressed just like you have to get dressed every day. Deal with the problems you have to deal with every day. You know, when he got there, there had to be a lot of discouragement. But then there was that other band of Judaizers that followed him everywhere, trying to distort what he was saying. You know? And we're telling lies about him on every hand. There had to be the opposition just had to be overwhelming. And I'm sure that Paul, in the context of that, probably felt like, hey, maybe I miss God. Maybe I'm not supposed to be in Corinth. It's one time when Paul says the Lord is speaking to me, the Lord says this to Paul. He said, listen, do not be afraid. For I have many here that worship me. Don't feel like you're all by yourself. Don't feel like you're all alone. Number one, I'm here. Don't be afraid. You move forward. You do what I've called you to do. And a lot of people, when they start moving into the will of God, they start having problems in their life. They oh, this must not be the will of God for my life. In reality, God's just confirming that's exactly where they need to be. In fact, Paul stayed on for a year, year and a half, building that church and witnessing that church and developing those ministries there. He discovered in the context that even of all the opposition, God is still on the throne. And God has called every one of us into ministry, and you are not alone, and you don't have to be afraid. There are other people out there he's called, and he will use the situations you go through to verify to you that you're in the right place, that you're, you're supposed to be in the middle of those things because that's where God wants to do something, and he'll endorse you, and he will build you up, and he will confirm what you're doing. You know, it's, it's interesting the way God works in every one of our lives. 
You know, there's people here that, when, that I know that I can call on when, when I've got something in my office and maybe I'm dealing with something I haven't experienced in my life and I can minister to them from the Word of God, but I'll usually say, you know, <clears throat> I want you, I'm going to give you a phone number and I'm going to have this person call you or you call them and I want you to talk to this particular person. Why? Because that person walked where you walked. That person's experienced what you've experienced. That person knows on a very close, first-hand basis what you're dealing with and I want to connect you with them. What has God done? That even in a failure in somebody's life, perhaps, God brought them out of that, delivered them, and then made them a minister of grace out of that. If I ask some of you to get up and say, hey, I want you to take the sermon next Sunday. I, 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 some of you, when I gave you the topic, wouldn't even have to study. I mean, your life's been studying that lesson. Your life's been, I mean, God just honed that message. It's your life message, so to say. And there's, there, that's our, our lives. God's developing something uniquely. God's gifted us uniquely. God's working in us uniquely. And that's the beauty of God's love and mercy towards you as an individual. He loves us all. He loves the lost world. But he loves you uniquely enough to do these things and allow these things and work in these situations to hone and develop that particular message and that particular ministry in your life and through your life. Don't resist God's mercy in the day of trouble. Don't complain to God in the day of trouble. Just hold on to him and let him do what he's desiring to do in those times. He will confirm his ministry through your life. The fifth thing is troubles come to con conquer the enemies, to conquer the strongholds that in, are in our life. There's nothing like a good shot of trouble that exposes your weakness. Nothing like a good shot of difficulty that shows you what you really like. Sometimes it can be just a little thing. Sometimes it takes a bigger thing. And sometimes when we see ourselves the way we see ourselves, it's certainly discouraging. You think, boy, is that where I am spiritually? <laughs> Have I not gone any further than that? And God, but God's a merciful God. He allows those things so you don't get stagnant, so you don't get stale, so you don't stay in the same place. God is committed to your maturity. He which began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And there's things that happen in our life to expose us to where perhaps maybe Satan's had an advantage in our life. And we see our weakness and I see our, our failures. Hey, if God doesn't do that in us, how much worse will we get if we are not stopped somewhere in this process? If we're not exposed to something in our life, we need this kind of maintenance hand of God's Holy Spirit working in our life so that we, we don't get where we're just dead in our, our spiritual life, living in mediocrity and in a rut. God is committed to you. And sometimes it's, it's, it's like a little burst of difficulty has to come in our life to get us moving forward again and to realize, that, hey, I've given ground to the enemy here or I've let the old flesh take over my life in this regard. I can't believe I, I look at, look at, I got to get right with God. I got to move on with God. I was talking to uh, someone very close to me this last week and I, we were on the phone and I began to tell him, hey, did you know about something that's related to a, a situation that they should have known about so, because it involved them? And man, this person went ballistic. Now, I just listened to it for a minute. But I can't believe that. 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 I say, that sounds like me on the other end of the phone. Of course, y'all have never done that. I said, well, you know, uh, I knew God wasn't going to let this person get along very long, away with that very long. I said, well, it's a situation where God, finally, we know about it, praise the Lord, so we can deal with it. And, Address the issue. So we hung up. About 30 minutes later, pop, 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 pop. Texts are coming over my phone. I can't believe I was so stupid. I'm so, please forgive me. I just, you know, and they went on this, I repent, I repent, I repent. I can't, I, I can't believe this stuff. I said, well, I can. You know, that's just our nature when we're walking in our flesh. That's why if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. That's why daily you've got to say, I'm not going to live in the flesh. I'm going to live in the spirit. I'm going to choose Jesus day over myself. And then we have to, Paul said, I die daily. In other words, I think he meant more than more than just once a day. I mean, through the day I'm dying. You know, I'm, I'm coming to the cross, I'm experiencing Christ. But God allows those things to see, hey, that was a problem in our life perhaps. Maybe that's where we have a need in our life. Maybe that's an area that God's ready to start working in our life. And by the way, if God showed you everything at one time he needs to work on, you'd probably die. Ah! I can't be that bad. <laughs> it's hopeless. No, God's merciful. And he will show us where the enemy gets us strong in our life because he wants us to walk in victory. And he wants to do something relevant in our life that makes Jesus alive to us in our life. So th there's this platform of trouble 
that, that we stand on sometime and we're in the middle of it. But understand, on that platform of trouble is also the grace and the deliverance of God will come. The children of Israel were going to battle against the Philistines. Philistines were com coming into land. It wasn't theirs. They were going to try to conquer it and, and cast Israel out. And every day they come up to the valley, I believe it's the Valley of Eli, and, and the, the Philistine army would stand on one side and the children of Israel would stand on the other side. And this went on for like 40 days. They'd go back at night, make camp, make the plans, do, here's what we're going to do in battle tomorrow. And then they'd, you know, they'd get up in the morning, start chanting the war cries, and they'd get up to the front line and peer across the valley and those other guys would be standing over there. But in the middle stood one guy named Goliath, and you know the story. And he's out there cursing God and just kind of threw a wrench in the whole you know, plan and strategy of war. It was outside the context of where our strategist have worked. And we have those kind of things that come into our life. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like this one thing just seems to be the biggest hindrance in our spiritual life. Somebody steps on the scene who gets a glimpse of what God's up to and says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the army of the living God? Amen. Now, that was a boy. Because sometimes we need to go back and realize God's bigger than that guy there. I don't care if he's nine foot nine or not. But, you know, the church is like that in so many ways. We're in our spiritual life like that. We go to church on Sunday. We make our battle plans. We cry our battle, you know, cries and sing our battle songs and wave our banners and run to the front line and don't do anything because there's something out there. Can't pray effectively. Can't witness effectively because there's something out there that's exposing my weakness. What do you do? That's when you, you stand up and you move forward. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But sometimes these issues are, will expose things in our life. Trouble comes to expose things in our life so that we can overcome in those areas of our life. The sixth thing, the last of this, is to conform us to the image of Christ because that's really what it's all about, isn't it? This is where God's bringing us to make us like Jesus, to mold us into the, to the very image of Christ Jesus, that he'd be seen and manifest in our life. And everything in your life God is working in, it's like the guy who was... Who was you know, made the beautiful stone statue of the, the, the beautiful horse that was raised up in battle and ready to go forward. And everybody was ooing and aahing at this beautiful stone monument and how it just looked like so, so, so good, just like it was getting ready to take off at any moment like it was alive. And they asked the artist, you've probably heard the story, how did you cr create such a beautiful, beautiful horse out of, of, of in this beautiful stone monument just out of this piece of rock? He said, well, I chiseled off everything that didn't look like a horse. Well, guess what God's doing in our life? He's chiseling off those things that don't look like Jesus. And sometimes I say, ouch, that hurts. But if it doesn't need to be there, it doesn't need to be there. And the Lord God is working. I love what John 15, I've had to remember it often, even ministry as well as in my personal life. In John 15, it says, you know, that, that, that God is the Father. Jesus, you know, he's, God, God is the qualifier. He's the vine dresser, and, you know, Jesus says, I, you know, I'm the true vine, and everyone that bear, it lives in me and abides in me will bear much fruit. And then he went on to say, hey, but if you don't bear fruit, you know, then, you know, you, you better get ready for some fire. There's going to be tribulation and trials in your life. Trials, and they're going to come. He said, but if you do bear fruit, you'll be pruned. So you can cry and moan and ache and whine. I got you know, you me through all this, God. I love you. He does it so you'll bear more fruit. I mean, they've been practicing that principle in, in, in orchards all across the world for centuries. That you want the trees to bear more fruit, you trim off the excess limbs, and so the sap won't flow those places. It goes into the, to the shorter limbs. It produces more fruit. It's the same thing in our life. God says, you know, I love you enough. Hearing my Father glorified, He said, you bear much fruit. So I want you to bear the most fruit in your life. So I, I will allow pruning to come into your life. I'll allow troubles to come in your life, which will chop off the, those areas, those excess areas, and the, you know, the, the, the excesses in your spiritual life, and get you down to reality in your spiritual life, so you can bear much fruit. So troubles come. I said last week that chastening comes not only in a positive sense and a negative sense. We talked about that a little bit earlier. But it says, Hebrews 12 says, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. That hurts. But he said, but afterwards it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It will yield the peaceable fruit right now. There's sometimes a chastening is a very positive thing, folks, in regard to our spiritual walk in life. Even when we've been walking with God, even when we've been serving the Lord, and we get this little attitude, well, Lord, I've been serving you as much as I know how. I've been moving forward in my spiritual walk. Why is this going on? Hey, because God wants you to go deeper. Because he wants you to bear more fruit. He wants you to experience more grace, and he wants you to experience more of him in your life. 
So that's the first three verses there of, of, of Psalms 20. But the last few verses really gives us where the response is. And verse 5 really wraps it up when he says, We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Beautiful thing here is that we will sing, we will set up our banners, and may the Lord fulfill our petitions. There's three important points right there that you just got to get a hold of as, as, as our response. The first thing is we praise God. He says, We will sing for joy. We sing. We praise the Lord. It's a declaration of basically three things. Life. One, it declares, I believe that God is present in my life. I, I welcome into my situation. I'm looking to him in my problems. I am trusting him in this dilemma. His, not only but his presence, it's a declaration of God's power. It's also a declaration of God's position, that he is not only stronger than these, all these things, he is over all these things. Not only is there nothing that's bigger than God, there's nothing better than God. Not is there anything not bigger than God, there's nothing more powerful than God, because he is over all things. He is the sovereign of the universe. There, he is the God above all, all right? He is the Lord of all lords, the king of all kings. He is God almighty. So that's what praise is. It, it verifies that. I believe you, God. So you need to learn, if you have not learned this lesson yet, that when troubles come, you get your mouth in gear and you start praising God. Well, I don't have anything to praise for. You've got everything to praise for. You've got the presence of God, and he's stronger than all these things. We, we've used the verse where Jesus said, you know, you know, with God, nothing's impossible. And that Greek preposition with is one that means face to face. If I just get God and get in God's face and let him get in my face, hey, there's nothing that can beat me. So I need to praise God. You say, but I don't feel like praising God. Then praise God, but I don't think I can praise God. Praise God. But, you know, this situation, praise God. But Brother Joe, it hurt. Praise God. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning. Not just in the best things or in good things, or better, but in all things. Rejoice in the Lord. And for the Baptist, he said, and again I say, rejoice. Just to be sure you get the message. Now, when the Lord does something, when he says, and again, there ought to be some attention paid at that point to see how important it is. One of the most important things you'll ever do. I've dealt with a lot of people in counseling who are in depression and despair in their life. And the best thing and the best counsel you can ever give anybody in that situation is this. You have got to learn to praise God. You praise. It redirects your mind. It redirects your heart. It redirects your focus. You've got to learn to praise God. But that's the first step. He says, you know, he says, we... In the day of trouble, may the Lord answer you. And then that verse 3 where he says, you know, we will, we will sing for joy over victory. And the second part he says, and, and we will set up our banners. Now, the banner had to do with that, that flag of victory, that place I'm going forward, I'm establishing, this is where the battle is, and this is where the battle's fought, and this is where victory is taken. This is where we are. So not only am I praising God, I'm pressing on. I am moving forward. In the name of our God, we're going to set up our banners. We're going to celebrate our victory right in the middle of the battle. But the battle's raging. We're still the victors. So we're not fighting for victory at the end of the battle. We're fighting from victory. We are in victory now. And that's our position right now. Oh, I just pray the Lord show up and give me the victory. He already gave you the victory. Jesus died on the cross and came out from the grave three days later. He gave us the victory. Now, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's already yours. It's been wrapped up and gift wrapped with a pretty little bow. Open the gift. It's yours. But you move forward. It's a, just as praise is a declaration of faith, you pressing on is another declaration of faith. And when you, step, you set that flag in battle, it means this is God's turf. Those flags are territorial signs. We have our flag that flies over our country. We go to an embassy in some other country. That's our piece of property. We put our flag. When we go in battle, we station our flags on our bases and our forward operating bases. That's turf where we are. You're going to deal with us. We're representing something. We represent someone. We rep hey, as Christians, we're representing the King of Kings yes. Yes. and the Lord of Hosts. Yes. Set your banner up. But, so we, but, but there's one element. Not only do we praise God and we press on, he says, on, on the name of our Lord. He talked about how, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions in the last part of that verse. In other words, there's, there's this prayer that continues to go on. You don't stop praying. Paul wrote the church at Thessalonians. He says, you know, you pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean I'm walking around on my knees and my hands folded out like this. It means that everything in my life I'm constantly turning over to the Lord. 
What are you facing right now? What's the big deal right now in your life? Oh, and it's my parents. <laughs> it's my wife. It's my husband. It's Goliath. It may look impenetrable. It may, look un- it may be like Jericho. It's, it's shut up on every side and there's no way to overcome it. Well, it just, but God's bigger than all those things. But what do you do? You pray. You look to God, and may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May he set you securely on high. May he answer you from the sanctuary, and may all your worship be acceptable in his sight. So you move forward in faith, and you take your position of victory, and you say, hey, I'm trusting God. So no matter what comes up, when your wife comes up to you and says, well, I don't know what to do. We've got these problems. We've got the kids of this or the finances of this. You turn to her and say, honey, we pray. Let's pray. And your husband comes to you and says, we got, man, this trouble on every hand. What are we going to do? We pray. And about all the things that have become kind of a byline and a logo for our family over the last several months of everything we dealt with that we talked about last Sunday, you can kind of, if you want to, the CDs are available, the DVDs, or you can go back to YouTube and find it. But it's out there. But basically, the kind of the anthem came. Because it seemed like not only were we dealing with physical issues, spiritual issues, things, and sons deploying, and issues in this, and issues in that, and daughter who gets pregnant again. Remember all the complications four years ago for those who were around back then that she went with? Hey, you just, we just kind of developed this new anthem. Whenever we present somebody, we just look at each other and say, we pray. And when we pray, we know our prayers are being heard. First John says, because if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. You say, well, I don't know what his will is. Well, then pray, and he'll show you his will. How can you live as a Christian and not pray? The answer is, you can't. How can you be victorious in your life and not pray? You can't. How can you experience a river that flows from your innermost being like a living fountain of life? You don't if you don't pray. Pray. And when you finish praying, keep praying. Because it's a constant. And look at the attitude of, of 1 Thessalonians. I believe this about the Lord fulfilling our petitions. It's just a constant flow of our life. I, there's something comes up, let me pray about that. Something here, I'm, I can pray about that. I'm, a, I'm turning that over to Jesus. I, basically, hey, I need to report to headquarters to find out what to do. <laughs> All right? And HQ, where is it? It's the throne room of God. Throne room of God. I need to report to God and find out what he wants me to do today. I got this issue. The enemy stuck his head up. What do I do? How, how do I move forward? What steps do I take? And I want you to know, I know some of the problems that some of you have been facing. We've prayed about it. We've talked about it. We've dealt with it. You continue to pray. You'll see God move if you haven't seen him already. He has not abandoned you. Don't ever get to that place. He never will. You have a covenant relationship with him that he cannot break. God made a promise to you, and God cannot tell a lie. He's faithful, faithful, faithful. Paul said, even when I've been unfaithful, he's been faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Folks, the day of trouble does come. Sometimes, if you're like me, it seems that it comes in, in greater floods at times. But I love this little saying I saw not too long ago. It says, wherever he does not rule, then he overrules. All right. And what you're doing when you come to those kind of situations where it seems like he's not ruling, then you ask him to come in mightily and to overrule in that situation. Verse 5 again, I know the Lord saves his anointing. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Who is that? It's Jesus. Some will boast in chariots and some will in horses. In other words, people think they can buy their way out of it or strengthen their way out of it, have enough power to get out of it. Hey, but we're going to boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down, speaking of our enemies and the problems. They have fallen, but we have risen and we've stood upright. Save, O Lord, and may the king answer us in the day we call. And he does answer us in the day we call. Praise God. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Reiterate the fact that if you don't know Christ, then I don't know how you can even navigate the storm.